Once again, welcome to Worship at Christ Church. My name is Nathan Malone. I'm one of the pastors here, and we welcome you to this time. Whether you're here on campus or you're worshiping with us online, we're glad that you're part of this. Last week, I told you about the upcoming annual conference that was going to be happening at Lake Junaluska. Well, I want to quickly report back to you and say we had a great time at the lake. I think we may have a picture. There's a scene from the ordination service on Sunday night. That's one of the highlights of annual conference. And our bishop is uh, ordaining one of the new elders for life in the church. Uh, we heard mission reports. I'll quickly tell you that uh, this church collected buckets for Zimbabwe. Uh, other districts collected uh, health kits and some other supplies. Altogether, those buckets and kits numbered close to 4,800 that will be going to Liberia and Zimbabwe. So you're a part of that, and we celebrate that. A lot of other reports of great things happening in the life of the church that we heard. The music was wonderful. Our music team was there to lead this year. Uh, Christina Malone, Willie Kitchens, uh, Riley Bayless, Sandy Asplin, and uh, Olivia McKeon that sings in this service. And our uh, choir was there on Tuesday night to lead us. It was just marvelous. They did just such a great job. And I am happy to report that your three pastors have been reappointed for another year here at Christ Church. And yes, um, David Hall and Debbie Stokes and I are delighted to be back with you to, to minister alongside you for another year and glad to be a part of what you're about here at Christ Church. Each week or most weeks during the school year, I have an open dialogue session on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. We're doing that a little bit more sporadically through the summer, and you can see those dates there. Uh, today's another day for one of those, and it's just it really is open for whatever's on your mind about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about Christian beliefs, uh, maybe some questions you have or struggles that you have. Usually those are in A12 in this back building, and that's why A12 is up there. Today, because of Bible school, we've had to shift some things around, so it'll be in A1 of that same building. You'll want to enter on the Morris Hill Road side and come in. We'll be in A1 at 4 o'clock if you'd like to be a part of that. And finally, kids, this is the week of Bible school, Stellar Vacation Bible School. Starts tomorrow, runs from 9 to noon throughout the week. And for any of you, if you have children in your family, this is 4-year-olds through 5th grade, uh, please get them signed up. They can still register and be a part of it. Tell your neighbors, offer to bring them uh, so that as many as possible can be a part of Bible school. Be in prayer for those that will be leading and teaching and guiding as, as well as all the children that will be participating. It's always a great week. It's always a highlight in the life of our church during the year. So be praying about that. As always, we ask you to let us know of your participation in this service. If you're here in the room, you can do that at the doorway. Or whether you're here or online, you can go to the church app. Let us know of your participation in this time, and we celebrate that. I believe it's time Mary Beth's got another great message for us today. Let's hear what she's got to say. Well, hello, and welcome to Children's Moment. I'm Mary Beth Hammett, the Children's Ministry Director at Christ, and I'm so glad that you have joined me today. So kids, gather around, and let's just chat for a minute. Has anyone ever said to you when you did something silly, you're silly as a goose? Yeah, well, I heard that sometimes when I was growing up. You may not have, but I have. But it got me thinking, I don't know that geese are silly. Have you ever really watched geese? I have. I think they're fascinating creatures. And one of the things they do when they fly is they fly in a V formation. And there's a reason for that because when they do that, the air that they move as they flap their wings gives the geese behind them more lift and they can fly further, which is really cool. But it's really hard on the one at the very first because they don't have anybody giving them lift. So they get tired. But when they get tired, they just drop back and somebody jumps up and takes the lead. That's what you call teamwork. And then I have a flock of geese that fly over my house every morning. And you know how I know they do that every morning? Yep, you're right, I hear them. Because they honk the whole time they're flying. And that's their way of encouraging everybody together. Well, who doesn't need encouragement? You've ever been trying to do something hard and you think, ah, oh, the only one trying to do this. But somebody comes around and gives you some words of encouragement, 
That's just like those geese honking for each other, helping them remember we're in this together. And then another cool thing about geese is if some one of the geese gets hurt, injured, or sick, they just go to the ground. Well, two other of the geese drop down too, and they stay with that goose until they're well and ready to join the flock. It sort of reminds me of how we in the church are supposed to work together to honor God, that we all work together to accomplish the mission. And when we need encouragement, we need to be honking for each other. And then of course, when anybody's sick or hurt, we gather around and help encourage and help them get through that period of time. So this week, as you go through your week, be a goose, honk for each other, help each other, and lead the way. So I will see you next time. Bye-bye.
And all the long your presence was where I found home. You were there and you're here right now. In every high and every low, you never left me without hope. You were good and you're good right now. I witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life with So I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy. God, you're worthy of all of it. Your promises never fail. I've got stories.
as we were planning vacation Bible school, we kind of put out a plea that says, if you can help, please step up and help, and you did. Thank you for that. Vacation Bible School is this week, and thank you for your offerings, because you may not think about it, but all the materials and the supplies and the snacks, all the things that we will provide this week are paid for right out of our offerings. You can give those today as you exit by dropping it in the boxes provided in the atrium. You can always send in a check or go online through the app or the website and give online. Now would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we come to you humbly today because we realize that we are creatures. We are the results of your creation. And so we are in awe of you. We're in awe of your power and your majesty. And yet, whenever we come to worship you, whether it's in our daily devotion and a quiet private time, or if it's on a Sunday when we gather together to worship, we trust that you hear us and you reach out to us. We know that you want relationships with us and that you love us and you provide for us. And so we have faith whenever we worship that you hear and you respond to us. When your son walked among us on earth, he instructed the apostles to let the little children come to him so that he could bless them. This week, a lot of little children will come to us. Now help us to love them, to care for them, and to bless them. Help us to grow as Christian disciples. Help us to do that by reading scripture and discussing it among ourselves in small groups, by praying regularly, and by coming to worship, and all the things that we do that help us to draw closer to you. And as we mature in our faith, help us to go where you send us and wherever we are to share the good news of Christ with others. We know that today there are some among us with really special needs, hurting hearts, for example, having lost a loved one. Reach out and touch them. Touch others with your healing hand, others who are ill and, and seek to hear your voice of healing. Some are making difficult decisions right now. We pray that you would bring to them a discerning spirit and wisdom that only you can provide. You have blessed Pastor Nathan with a message for us. As he preaches that, we ask that you bless him and then bless us that we would hear it, understand it, and go and live it. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Several years ago, Eugene Peterson translated the Bible into an everyday language translation. He titled simply, The Message. And he gives an introduction to each of the books of the Bible. He's very good at those. Here's the opening line, the opening sentence of his introduction to the letters to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. When people become Christians, they don't at the same moment become nice. I don't know if you've experienced that or not. The Corinthian Christians gave their founding pastor, Paul, more trouble than all his other churches put together. I believe these two letters give us the best picture of what life looked like in the first century for those followers of Jesus as they learned how to live life together as the people of Christ. We sometimes use the, the phrase rubbing shoulders with each other to talk about being in close proximity and, and learning life lessons and some of that's uh, kind of difficult sometimes as we rub shoulders together. Well, I see many lessons that Paul and those people of Corinth there in the first century learned as they rub shoulders together that still guide us today as we continue to learn to live the way of Jesus Christ and not just as individual Christians. This was not intended for just individual Christians. It was intended to be read to the whole church. It was intended for the whole church. So it's for us as the church, as the people of Christ, as we rub shoulders together, if you will. The book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 11, tells us that Paul lived in Corinth for 18 months, establishing the church there and helping those people begin to learn the way of Jesus. And when he left, he had hoped to return, but apparently was not able to. After he moved on to other cities, 
messengers were sent at some later time to say to him, Paul, there's some things have come up among us. There's some things we're struggling with. We didn't talk about this when you were here. What do we do in this situation? All kinds of issues and struggles that they were having. Now, I can't cover all those today, but I will, again, try to lift up a few lessons out of these letters that will hopefully inspire you to read both of them, and I do encourage that. First lesson, be sure the Holy Spirit is guiding you when you engage in disputes. Paul uh, admonishes these people for a dispute that they're having and why they're having it. But that's not to say he didn't have disputes. In fact, he disputes with some people in amongst this le these letters. And we all have disputes. It's not about whether we have disputes or not. We're going to have those. It's, is the Holy Spirit, we need to always ask ourselves, is the Holy Spirit guiding me in what this is about and how I'm going about being a part of it? Here's how he wrote to them in chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Maybe a good lesson still for us. Next lesson. Sexual immorality is not to be tolerated among the people of Christ. He addresses that issue in a couple of different places, especially in the first letter. And it, um, the, the key lesson or the key point he makes in chapter 6 at verse 19 do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Next lesson. Christians give up what they want to do for the good of others. I'm reminded here of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. And as he talks about that in chapter 8, he begins with a passage, uh, just one short sentence there that I think is so uh, instructive for us. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You ever notice how when you're sure you're right about something, you can get real confident and arrogant and boastful and let's just say hard to be around? I think that's what he's getting at there. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And in verse 9, be careful that, you ex that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. And then he comes back to that in chapter 10 with these. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And I think what he's getting at is no one should seek their own good when it's going to interfere with the good of others. That leads right into the next lesson. We adapt our approach with whoever we're trying to reach for Christ. And here's how he talks about that in chapter 9 at two different verses. Though I am free... And belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Because that's the mission. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. It's a focus on others. Next lesson out of chapter 10. You always have a choice when you're tempted to do something. This verse is one that I've heard down through the years, I think get misinterpreted, misunderstood by people. Some translations, instead of the word tempted, has the word tested. And so I will sometimes hear people say, you know, it says in the Bible that God won't put any, any more on me than I can bear. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about temptation. Listen to it. 
No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humans. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. All right. Moving on into the, a major section of 1 Corinthians is chapters 12 through 14. It's in that section that he deals with spiritual gifts. Uh, they had allowed, apparently they're in Corinth, they had allowed uh, these gifts that God had given to them through the Holy Spirit to become divisive, primarily because some of them were thinking that their gift was more important than other gifts. And you can imagine how that would cause division and, and div divisiveness. And so he addresses that here. And he uses the image of the body of Christ to talk about the church. So he first talks about this divisiveness and in chapter 12 at verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Our gifts are not just for us as individuals, but for the building up of the church, for the increase of the church and the good of the church. And at verse 27, after he talks about this body of Christ and what it means to be a body, he says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. At the end of what we call chapter 12, remember these chapter uh, numbers and verse numbers weren't there when he first wrote this. But at the end of chapter 12, it's obvious that he's moving into a new section, and he gives this verse at verse 31. Now, eagerly desire the the greater gifts, he says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And that's where we get what we often refer to as the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to share, I want to share the verses at the beginning and the end of that chapter uh, because he's dealing with some of the highest, best ways, at least in that situation, of being a Christian. And yet he says, and here's the lesson I would offer from these first few verses, without the love of Christ, don't bother. Don't even bother. If you, don't, you, you can be supposedly doing really good things for Jesus, but if you don't have his love in you, don't bother because it's not a good representation of Jesus if there's not love in the midst of it. Here's how he talks about that. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, think about that, all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I gain nothing. I am nothing. If I give all I possess, think about that. If I give everything I have to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So without the love of Christ, don't bother. Well, that's where he begins to define love, and I invite you to go read that again for yourself. And he comes back to those same issues at the end. Here's the lesson I think I pull from these final verses in this chapter. We are all limited in what we can do. The love of Christ brings it all together. Here's how he talks about it. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. For now we see only in a, a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And here's these greater gifts in this higher, more excellent way. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these 
is love. All right, then into chapter 14. I want to mention something here. There are people still today who believe that women should not be preachers. And they've got proof right here in this chapter. I'm going to give it to you. I, I didn't submit it to be put on the screen, but I, I, I just want to mention that. I do believe for that time and place and context, Paul was dealing with a particular situation that he needed to say that. But there are other places in the Scripture that it's obvious that women are in leadership and do speak and do help out and, and even lead in the church. More importantly for me is that it's obvious to me it's very clear to me that the Holy Spirit has been calling women to lead in the church, to preach in the church, to be leaders among us for many, many years. Uh, but it's at, I'll, I'll give you the verse, chapter 14, verse 34, in case you need some support for your argument. Here it is. It says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak. So if you want to make that argument, there's your proof. I said at Holston Annual Conference this past week under the leadership of Bishop Deborah Wallace Paget, She was here to preach for us back in the fall. And it's, it is obvious that the Holy Spirit is within her leading. It is obvious that she's been called to lead in the church. And she's been doing, not even before she became a bishop, she was a wonderful pastor, and there's record of that. It's obvious to me that the Holy Spirit has work, is at work in her. She's a, still a good preacher and a good teacher. I'll just leave that there for now. But if you want to talk about it, I'd be glad to talk about it further sometime. In fact, we're having one of those dialogue sessions this afternoon. Come and if that's something you want to talk about, we'll do so. All right, into chapter 15. Next lesson. What God did at Easter is at the core of our faith. Uh, Paul is here arguing, disputing, with those who believe there is no resurrection of the dead, that what you get in this world, in this life, that's it. He's arguing against that in chapter 15. At verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And in verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. He's quoting out of Isaiah right there. And then from Hosea, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You can know that there's more to come after this life. And then at the end of chapter 16, at the end of this letter, or just, is just this one verse that I offer as, as good encouragement. He says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. All right, moving quickly on into the second letter. By the way, there are apparently, scholars say there were apparently more than just two letters in fact, one of them may have been kind of uh, edited into the second letter that we have. We'll not deal with that issue here right now, but I just mentioned that as a side note. Great lesson in chapter 4, and it is this, don't ever give up. Stay faithful in serving our Lord's mission. Here's how he writes about that. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And in verse 7, but we have this treasure, this ministry that we get to be a part of. We have this treasure in jars of clay, these bodies that we live in, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, he says, but not crushed. Perplexed at times, but not in despair. Pers persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. Can't be. And in verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. He says that again. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, this body that we live in, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And then, as Christians, we are representatives of Christ. We covered this one about a month ago. Guys, I'm going to skip down to the next uh, set of verses. I'm going to go to verse uh, 14. For Christ's love compels us. This is a passage that's near and dear to me. I try to read it uh, regularly. Um, and here it is. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And this is the verse. This next verse is the one that's on my license plate of my car, 2COR518. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. This next lesson I offer comes out of, uh, Paul has been taking a, receiving an offering among all the churches, not just in Corinth, but all those cities that he visited, he was receiving an offering for the poor back in Jerusalem. But there's some great lessons for all of us in our giving and in our generosity. And here it is. Here's the lesson I would offer. Be generous because God is generous. We're simply following the example of the God we worship. He says, but since you excel in everything in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And guys, let's skip those, those next couple of verses and go to remember this. At chapter 9, at verse 6, remember this, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, and he quotes from Psalm 112 right here, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Last lesson. God can use our weaknesses for God's purposes. Paul speaks here of what he calls a thorn in the flesh. And scholars have speculated about what that was down through the years. Some said it was uh, poor eyesight, that he was almost blind possibly. Uh, some said it was a stuttering or a, he had difficulty speaking at times. It could have been those, could have been something else. But here's how he writes about it. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, uh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong because of Christ. At chapter 13, verse 11, then these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for these lessons. Sometimes we learn lessons from others in what they've experienced. And even going all the way back into the first century, we hear these lessons that Paul and these people, these Christians in Corinth learned. They still guide us. You still guide us through what they learned that we might better understand what it means to be your people. So thank you for these and help us continue to seek to learn Forgive us when we think we have it all figured out and we understand fully and remind us that we've got much more to learn. Continue to teach us to be your people. Continue to help us stay close to you, learn from you so that we can help others come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for our closing song? And as you do that, hear this. If you're here today and would like to come and profess your faith in Christ, to be baptized, if you're um, ready to join the church, we'd be happy to welcome you into the fellowship of this church. If you're at home and want to discuss those, just call or text me. I'll be here on the front row.
sermon on the Corinthian letters that we hear this benediction. It's my favorite. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Bow with me. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.